Okay, we're ready to go. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, hello, my name is Dave Zapponi, and I'm the Executive Director of ECHO, otherwise known as the Educational Council of Homeowners. We are based in San Jose with satellite offices in Tracy and Laguna Hills, California. Thank you for joining us for this ECHO live stream event on technology that benefits HOA boards, featuring Barry Ross. ECHO is a statewide nonprofit association created to support HOA board members and engaged homeowners. Our mission is to foster a better quality of life in community associations through education, advocacy, and connection. ECHO is 47 years old, which makes it the oldest association representing the collective interests of homeowner associations in the state of California. It prides itself on providing quality educational programs focused on building stronger communities. Thank you to our event sponsor, Q&A sponsor, HOA Alchemy. They also manage ECHO's website and other technologies. Before we move forward with the program, please note the webinar is scheduled for an hour and a half. Feel free to leave the meeting at any time. We will mute attendees during the presentation to assist with sound quality and to assist the speaker in developing concepts. Please use the Q&A feature, not the chat feature, to ask content-related questions. You may ask questions throughout the presentation using the Q&A feature. Please be courteous and respectful of the, of the meeting participants, participants at all times. We reserve the right to mute participants at any time and for any reason during the meeting. The program is copyrighted by ECHO and will be recorded. We do not give permission to others to record the meeting without prior written authorization. ECHO is a nonprofit corporation which has and strictly follows an antitrust policy. It is available for review on our website at www.echo-ca.org. Finally, none of what is said during the meeting shall be construed as specific legal advice from either the speaker, speaker or ECHO. If you wish to receive specific advice, we encourage you to ask your attorney. At this time, I will introduce our speaker. Barry Ross is the president and co-founder of Ross & Ross International and a digital transformation specialist with over 20 years of experience. Barry? Oh, thank you. Give me one second here. Thank you uh, for the introductions, uh, Hannah and David. And today we're gonna cover three major areas relating to uh, the board. The first is going to talk a little bit about the coronavirus and the trends and impact on not only HOA board and board members, but most of us that are working out of our home these days. Uh, the second, we'll go into the major area where we'll talk about new technology that board members and the community can benefit from. And I'm going to share some of the ideas that might be able to be helpful for your organization. And then the last is uh, hot technology tips for working at home, and that's slightly modified to be uh, more focused on practical best practice tips. If you're in your house, you're working on your computers and your technology, what are some good ideas that other people have benefited from and, and apply those? So with that, well, let's get started with that first subject, uh, trends and impact of the coronavirus. So one of the first things that I thought was interesting for this section was a survey that came out talking about not all the wonderful benefits of working at home, but some of the real issues that we have to deal with as a, a um, worker sitting in our home doing various work, whether it's board work or whether it's work for your office or personal. So there, there's a handful of things that were very interesting out of the survey. Uh, it was, um, took place the end of April, beginning of May, published in the middle of May. And there are a couple of things that I could relate to and most of the people I work with seem to have the same issue. There seems to be an awful lot of distractions and a lack of focus when first getting settled into working out of your house. Uh, then the isolation has become a big issue. Some people feel really uncomfortable uh, being uh, just uh, alone. And then uh, blurring between the lines of work and family, 
uh, adjusting to the new work dynamic if you have children at home and you're trying to teach them or whether you have uh, family members that are home that you're not used to uh, it is definitely a different work environment uh, and then the technology is always an issue when everybody ended up getting locked down one of the first issues that i was hearing about is old computers outdated software slow internet connections and within a very short period of time, an awful lot of people got those redressed. And in fact, there became a shortage from, for a lot of products that people needed. So the first issue is the biggest challenge working at home. These are the five that you probably uh, have heard or feel yourself. The, the next big trend and the impact on the board and the community is safety. Uh, every place you turn around, people are very concerned about, is it safe yet? When is it going to be safe? How long is it going to take to feel safe? And it's whether you're going to go out to a restaurant, a movie, see your friends, have a barbecue, or in the community standpoint, is when are you going to have a board meeting face-to-face? -face? Uh, when are you going to be able to use the facilities, uh, whether it's tennis courts, swimming pools, clubhouses? All those are issues. So the only thing I wanted to bring up on, on this particular slide was people range between a couple of months for the people that are super optimistic, but somewhere between six and 18 months, things will kind of hopefully get back to normal. And the six things I put on the slide are pretty much agreed to, to almost every leading health expert uh, in 200 uh, countries. So the point I was going to make is, uh, take it when you get a chance as a board, putting together your list, if you've not already done this, of what are the key things that are going to make your community safe, and then be able to kind of outline how long you think it's going to take. Uh, last night, I attended my second virtual board meeting, which we're going to talk more about later. And when I did that, uh, one of the issues that came up is, when are we opening up the pool? It's really nice the next couple of days. And the uh, answer of the board was we had to go back and say, we have to wait another 30 days at this point uh, before we uh, revisit this because the state of California requires someone to be around the pool and we don't have anybody that's you know, lifeguard or anything, anything like that, we can't fund it. So at this point, the board decided to still keep everything closed and then revisit it. But those are the types of things that having some sort of projected plan uh, people would really appreciate. Thanks. So before we leave this, I just wanted to uh, share a couple of uh, good feelings. As preparing for this section, I took a look at some surveys and I, I apologize for the size of this, this graph. It literally was uh, captured from another survey document that I took and it was as, this is as good as it got. But there's a company called Kronos, which does time card tracking. So, and it's a very large company, if you, you happen to have heard of it. It's used all over the United States, and they know when someone's checking in and checking out with a time card. So what this showed was there's five industries that um, have crashed during the month of March and April, and then towards the end of April, going into May, they started coming back up. So some good news was there was increased activity in the healthcare industry, the manufacturing industry, the retail restaurant industry, uh, which has to be the pickup and deliveries, uh, shipping and warehousing, translate Amazon and Walmart deliveries, and uh, food deliveries, and then the public sector. So there is some good news that we're already into June, this was already in May, and things were starting to pick back up as we slowly open up things. This next section is going to be, uh, to me, it's kind of fun because uh, I live in a condominium and I work with all the issues that typically happen uh, in, you know, the, the, the um, life and times of being in a, in a community. I also am working on a committee right now with the board for video security. And I've got a chance to deal with all of the um, good news about technology and some of the limitations. So this section we're going to go into, what are some things that can help us? And the first one we're going to do is, of course, virtual meetings or video meetings. And we tried to put a little poll together to get some feedback from the audience. So if, uh, Hannah, you could put that up, that would be great. We'll spend a couple of minutes, see if people can respond. It's real simple. We asked um, straightforward, have you attended a virtual board meeting yet? Yes or no? As I mentioned just a minute ago, 
futuristic. So we'll leave this up for a minute and um, we'll get try to get most of the audience's response to it. That would, that would be, a, <laughs> <I> would, <laughs> it seems to be overwhelmingly yes though. <laughs> okay, I haven't seen the results yet, but I'm over there trying to click to add my two cents and there's a big red sign that just popped up said host and panels can't vote. <laughs> So I just realized I can't, can't participate. But what I can share is um, this is my second virtual meeting, board meeting that I attended. Uh, what the last one literally was last night. And I have to admit, my wife and I absolutely love the idea of attending board meetings with a glass of red wine in our hand on the couch while watching on our laptop in our living room. So I'm a yes vote in terms of this is a really good advantage of technology. So Barry, it looks like we have 85% of the audience <laughs> that say yes and 15% that have not attended a virtual board meeting. So oh, I'm gonna okay. go ahead and end this poll. Great. All right. And we'll move on. Okay, well good, this actually helps me a bit because um, what I wanted to do with this slide was talk a little bit about not only the technology that you can use for a virtual board meeting, but also just other projects as board members you could take advantage of. Uh, this new technology is really powerful. And in the last five years, the prices have dropped quite a bit and made, they made it a lot easier. So as a result of that, there's, there's a lot more things that you can do. And as a result of the coronavirus, uh, I don't know about any of you, and actually this was a poll that I forgot to ask you about, was I was thinking we should do a poll, how many people have done a happy hour um, virtual meeting with the friends and family or even coworkers? Because my wife and I have gotten to the point now where we're having trouble over the weekend getting the happy hour schedule with our friends and family in place because people seem to like this an awful lot. And my wife's from London, so we have virtual happy hours from London. Um, my family's back in New York. And uh, let's see what I was going to say. The, the other one that's unusual is I have a group of friends from high school that all of a sudden wanted to do happy hours after 20 years. I uh, hadn't seen them. And every other week now, I'm doing a happy hour with my high school friends, which has been a lot of fun. So with video technology, you have video meetings, calls, webinars like we're doing today, also training like we're doing today, educating people uh, on things that you can do, as well as making phone calls. For those of you that haven't thought about this, Zoom in particular happens to have one software application that gives you access to a full-blown phone system, as well as all these other things that you might be using Zoom for. Uh, the other thing I would share about Zoom uh, is that uh, we're using this through Echo, and if you're not aware of it, Echo has made an agreement with Zoom where they're helping board members set up Zoom virtual meetings. And it sounds like given that percentage, uh, either you've worked with Echo or you've uh, figured out yourself, it's pretty easy. But uh, Echo's done a really good job helping with a little bit of training up front and then tech support when you're doing the meeting itself. So for those of you that haven't tried it yet, it is worth trying, even if you have a, you know, a few people, it's a, a good exercise to go through and see what it's like because it does work quite well. The other thing I wanted to mention on this, this particular uh, section was that Zoom has gotten all the buzz. And if you haven't known this, uh, Zoom is a business to business company. Prior to this all happening, they had about 10 million users a day uh, since they've been in existence, I guess the last, I guess almost 10 years, I think they've been around. So uh, they have 10, they had 10 million going into the coronavirus. Within two months, they jumped to 300 million users. Now they, they didn't have any problem scaling because they were in a cloud environment that just scales. So they had no problem going from 10 to 300 million. The big issue they had was they found some security issues that they were able to fix very quickly. And they continue to find little minor things they have to fix. But overall, the company is a pretty solid company. Uh, I think uh, you'll find that that's a, overall a very good product to work with. However, it's not the only one. So the other four that you should probably be aware of is, um, we'll go through those quickly. Z uh, Google Meet uh, is replacing something called Hangouts, Google Hangouts. So you've probably heard of Google Hangouts maybe at some point. 
but Google Meet's kind of the new shiny product that uh, Google's showing off. It's free for people that use Google products, Google Office, and it's really good if all of you are using Google and you're comfortable, that could be a good alternative to you. Price is right also, it's free. If you're a Microsoft group, then Microsoft Teams might be a good op option for you. If everybody on your board is really comfortable with Microsoft and you really like Microsoft, don't want to learn something else, Microsoft Teams is an alternative to, uh, to Zoom. Microsoft's been pushing it really hard. So uh, in business, it's being um, really emphasized by Microsoft and uh, it works quite well. Now, some of you may use, have used Skype in the past and have used it even for doing maybe your meetings. It works, it's great, it's been around for decades. Microsoft bought them probably a decade ago, but they've not done much with it. So if you like Skype, keep using it, but most people are not going to Skype anymore. It's all these other areas and I can tell you, it seems like Microsoft is not putting a lot of effort into Skype and putting all their resources and R&D into Microsoft Teams. So just in terms of where things are going in the future. And then of course, if you're an Apple user and your whole team of board members use Apple, uh, Apple is a great solution for video conferencing up to about 32 users, that's about the max. So if you have a smaller group, you just wanna talk over video, everybody uses Apple, you can make use of Apple FaceTime, no problem at all. Uh, the only thing is if anybody is not using Apple, they're out of luck, they can't participate. And that's where WhatsApp comes in. WhatsApp is a really great messaging app. And it was used overseas first. It was actually uh, developed by an Israeli company. It took off like crazy all over the world, but not in the United States. People were still using you know, Apple's uh, technology and Google's technology and Microsoft. Um, but WhatsApp was being used all over the world because it worked in both Apple and worked on Android. And it worked quite well. They've added video conferencing up to eight users. So if you have a really small group of people that want to do a board meeting and you want to have both Apple and Android, WhatsApp can, can work as well. And again, if you're already using it, then it's, it's that much easier. So overall, you have five different options. Uh, Zoom is being uh, helped by Echo. So if you have needs um, you know, to kind of get started, a little hand-holding, uh, the people at Echo can help you do that with Zoom. And right now, uh, you know, for the time being, it's free, which I think is great. Okay, next slide. Okay. So this area I really look forward to uh, in, the, in the presentation. So the community management industry is probably five years, almost 10 years behind some of the, the companies that I've visited with and met with. Uh, there's a, a lot of advantages and a lot of new capabilities on the new technology that almost every software company has switched to. It's cloud and mobile, which you've all probably heard of, but the older legacy systems, which is how most small businesses have been in existence for the last 15, 20 years. And it's usually a client server product that is sitting in a back room, a closet, it could be an office, could be home. Uh, and essentially that software was developed and designed probably 10, 15, maybe even 20 years ago. The newer systems that are available are game changers in terms of functionality and capability, not only for today, but going forward. So what I would like to do today is make the point that if you have a community management company that is helping your community and helping your board and supporting it, uh, you should be looking into whether they have upgraded to cloud and mobile technology. And if not, why not? Because the feature sets that are available literally make your job easier, takes less time, things speed up, and there's better communications as a result of it. So on this slide, I'm just gonna go through a couple of the feature sets that are pretty terrific by having cloud and mobile available. And I wanna share these with you to emphasize, you know, some of the things that may be a little bit different with this. The other thing that I would point out is 
the use of new technology is a good thing, not only for the board and the community, but it's also good for the, the company uh, that is installing it, because this is typically done by the community management companies. And they can not only improve their productivity and lower their costs by putting in technology like this, uh, and they can help all of the people that they work for. So again, I want to share that the best thing that I see is talking to your companies and discussing you know, things that they can do to help improve service and make your lives a lot easier and give better service to the community. So let's get, get into this. Uh, first one is real-time accounting. Uh, a lot of the old systems are batch processing. If you look at the old Quicken systems, Quicken Books was designed for small business. Uh, they have an old legacy client service system that's still in existence in millions of small businesses. The problem is QuickBooks has taken all of their resources in R&D and put it into the cloud and mobile version of QuickBooks Cloud and have the only thing they're doing is making sure that the other system keeps running, but none of the new features are ever going to be delivered to those old systems. So in this scenario, with accounting, used to be usually everything tended to be about a batch report, batch accounting, batch processing. Uh, nowadays, everything's real time. Everything goes in, everything gets updated. Uh, that's a real advantage if you're trying to get information, uh, trying to make a decision in the board. One of my pet peeves is project management and work orders and, being, and having that communications. Uh, I can't uh, tell you how frustrating it's been, at least for me, when I would have something that needs to get done, a tree needs to be cut, something needs, a door was damaged, needs to be painted. And I put in a request, and it could be either an email or you can manually fill out a little piece of paper and drop it in a little box. And then it kind of goes off, and sometimes you hear and sometimes you don't. And uh, the company on the other side has to take that information, type it into very often an Excel spreadsheet, and then periodically send out emails to update everybody, everybody on what's the status. I know there's one company that we worked with that they did this, they put it into an Excel spreadsheet, and at the end of the day, uh, the poor administrative person was sitting, sending out 20 emails to the 20 property managers every afternoon to tell them what are all the new work orders that have to be done and any updates that they're aware of uh, to them by email. So it was a very cumbersome pro process for everybody. With the new systems, the ordering takes place on the web or email or on your, your smartphone, but it goes right into the system, immediately gets logged in and an update immediately comes out to the user. So we're, you're in a position where the, it's automated, so the actual property manager doesn't have to spend a lot of time dealing with the process. The property manager gets updated and the requester gets updated. Say something needed to be painted, the uh, paint had to be ordered and it was back ordered, so it might take a week or two. So when the property manager can pop in a note that just says, we ordered the paint, it'll take two weeks, without having to do anything, it automatically updates the original user. When the next step comes where they have to come to your house, um, you'll get a note that says, we need to schedule that. And then that also is updated for both the property manager and the homeowners. All of that comes uh, automated reducing the amount of time that the property managers have to spend, and it reduces the frustration of the person that's requesting the order or the board member that's going through that. The other feature, e-signatures, is another aspect that I think is um, a real benefit to the board, is there are a lot of one-page documents that have to be signed, sometimes large reports that may have to be signed or approved, um, you can now have that all electronically done built into the system. So if there's a document that needs to go out, it comes out at e-signature. If you're a paper person, you can always print it out at your house. If you're someone that doesn't mind digitally, you can read it on screen, you can digitally sign it, and off it goes. Reduces the amount of time it takes to get something done, reduces the amount of paperwork, and sometimes you might have to wait for something to be printed at an office and then delivered to you, maybe at a board meeting. That all can be done in advance and electronically. Another item is uh, portals. Uh, these are web screen logins for individuals that either board members or homeowners have access to a whole slew of information to do the job. So for a board, you may have a summary of all the projects. 
You may have any collection issues. You may have uh, financial reports if you're the finance board member. All of these items are in one place to go. You don't have to log into all sorts of different systems. Even banking system information on some of the, these um, cloud and mobile systems can be presented onto your portal so you can have access to that. Uh, for homeowners, any of these work orders that they might have put, whether they've paid, uh, when their payment is due, uh, any sort of um, other projects that, that may be interested in uh, newsletters, all of that could be in one place for people. And then if the company is using a mobile app, all of that can be available on the go, whether you're out on vacation or here, you get the same information. Uh, broadcast texting uh, is something that not many companies are doing yet, but it's something that is for millennials is a, is a must have. And for most of us, it's nice to have these texts, whether it's from your bank or whether it's from Amazon with shipping. Well, in a community, we have a lot of issues that are starting to show up, emergencies that we haven't, I think, worried about in the past. You know, for example, the coronavirus. Our complex had one of our property managers get the coronavirus, the bad kind, spent a week in the hospital and weeks recovering. But when he went into the hospital, it was through word of mouth that people found out that he went in and everybody was wondering, when's the last time I was with this guy? And it would have been really nice if there's some sort of outbreak that takes place in the property, you have the ability to send out a broadcast that's saying, we just got hit, everybody be careful. If you've been around this person, you know, go see a doctor. Uh, just as a, a side note, I'm talking about the coronavirus, we have in California earthquakes, we even have tornadoes, we have floods, mudslides, uh, we can have a tsunami. There are so many things in the state of California, fires, uh, wildfires. Uh, you, you need to have very quick statements that go through uh, quick information to your, your community. And this type of feature set is cumbersome to add on, but it's built into a lot of the systems that are out there. And then the last thing I was going to mention is the banking account integration. Uh, again, some of the systems you might be able to have account, account bank accounting inter integration into a portal so that if you're looking at bank statements or you're looking at bank information with the finance committee, you have the ability to have that at your portal instead of having to log into other systems or waiting for the reports to actually come through. Uh, it could be automatically connected. So in this area, there was a lot to talk about, but the key point um, through all of this was a very heavy, heavy emphasis on uh, cloud and mobile, there is no excuse going forward for companies not to be moving here. It, they may not have it today, but it should be a discussion and every company should be discussing when are they going to have those feature sets. Because as a board member, it takes an awful lot of pressure off of you if, the for, the, for example, the work orders, if nothing's getting done, the worst scenario I've seen is sitting in a board meeting and listening to the homeowners complain about something, not hearing the status, not knowing what's going on, or something not getting done. And uh, it tends to be a very frustrating, I would imagine, part of a board meeting, uh, sitting through that part of it. Next slide. Okay. This next section is kind of interesting because of the coronavirus. Uh, so what I'm showing here is the package delivery problem that exists you know, throughout America. So the e-commerce marketplace has exploded in the last two months, three months. It was about 15% the end of last year. And when the, the coronavirus hit, we all got locked in, we jumped to 25% of all retail sales are now being done by e-commerce. When you have an increase in e-commerce, you have an increase in lots of packages come into your front door, or in this case, this is the lobby of the building I'm in, uh, being stacked up in front of all the mailboxes. This then results in a tremendous increase in crime and porch pirates, as they're called, where you go in and expect a package and find out someone stole the package, and you might find outside an empty box and whatever you were expecting could be gone. Not so funny if it's your medication that's being delivered, not so funny if it's an heirloom that needs to be delivered, uh, and just general pain in the neck for some of the other stuff that you're dealing with. If you're a larger complex, one of the options that are available these days are package lockers. 
And if you have not looked into this before, this is something that could be a real benefit. Again, attending the board meeting, one of the things that you do here is that if your packages are being robbed, usually they come to the board members, you either get emails or you get yelled at at a board meeting about when are we gonna do something about this? What I was gonna uh, say about that is that because we've had this problem, we've had packages disappear, we've had the police come in to give us kind of updates in our board meeting. And they were very clear. They said, if you have packages stolen and you have no video, we can't help you with finding it and it's unlikely we're gonna find the suspect. So it's just gone. If you have video security and we recognize the person, we could potentially capture the person but it's very unlikely you'll get your stuff back. And that's where these lockers come in, is that the only way to prevent your packages from getting stolen, if that's a problem in your area, is going to be having them locked up. And these lockers started with Amazon. I don't know if you've been to Whole Foods or used these, but Amazon uh, first rolled these out uh, put them in places like Whole Foods and, and office buildings. And the way it works is the company comes and delivers a package. They go to this machine, they scan in your package, and a door opens based on the size of the package. The people, the delivery people pop it in, whether it's Federal Express or UPS or mail, the mail people. Uh, they close the door and the system automatically will send you an alert, either email or text, depending on what you've set up and tell you, here's your pa secret passcode, one-time password. Whenever you can, come and pick up your package and it will be there for you. You come in, you basically can scan it these days or punch, punch in the code and the door pops open, you get your package. You could also do returns that way. So these systems are really impressive. This is all digital, very modern. Some of them come with uh, video cameras for security. Some of them light up. The example I have on the right is an outdoor unit. They have indoor units as well. Uh, they have to be installed. They literally are you know, drilled into the concrete or the flooring or the walls. So they're pretty sturdy in terms of what they do. Some of them have security devices on them. Uh, but the concept is going to become a bigger, bigger issue. So when you're looking at your board job and you're looking at technology that could help make your job a little bit easier and do a better job for your community, these type of devices are something to definitely look at. They're not inexpensive so that you're, you're typically going to have to look for the budgeting on these. And if you're doing some sort of renovation or you're doing some budget planning, this is where you probably want to look at it. Um, I've seen prices from the research I've done somewhere you can get as low as six for like a refurbished unit, 6,000. Uh, but typically you're looking between 10 and $20,000 per locker, depending on the size you're gonna get. And um, I can't emphasize enough, uh, if you have enough challenges with what you're doing, uh, this is certainly going to be a good investment. Last night I was hearing about a roof leak that had to be fixed, and we were gonna blow through $8,000 to fix this leak without a blink of an eye for one item that was kind of a minor leak. Uh, this is something that potentially every month you're gonna be getting more and more grief for if the package issue isn't being addressed. So again, uh, as a technology, this is pretty good stuff. Okay, our next subject's gonna be on video security. Uh, actually, Dave, uh, Dave and Hannah asked me to add this in because I'm working on a project for our own complex and we're, we've been going through a, a whole process to bring video security into a five building complex and uh, we figured we'd, we'd spend a little bit of time on this. Hannah, could you do the poll? Yes, yes. I'm going to launch the poll for everyone to go ahead and answer and we'll see what kind of response we get back. So the question is, do you have video surveillance security at your HOA? Okay, so it looks like about 41% said yes and 59% said no. Interesting. 
Yeah, it's very interesting. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and end this poll. And that's that's pretty close. 41% yes, 59% no. Yeah, about 50-50. And there we go. Excellent. So on this particular subject, given that half the group has uh, invested in this, half hasn't, I just want to cover a couple of key points that are worth sharing. I'm guessing the larger complexes probably have video security because they have had a larger budget to be able to do with this and a larger community to keep safe. Uh, so what I was going to say is in dealing with larger complexes, video security continues to be a pretty expensive investment. Uh, you need larger areas to cover, you need to have it have a lot of the equipment installed, and you need a little bit higher quality equipment to, you know, survive some of the things where it's going to be. And uh, then you have the installation of it itself, as well as the monitoring and the, the um, security for the video footage and security access. There's a lot of extra things that you can put in place that can run the costs up, which is why half the group probably doesn't have it. Now, the, the good news is what I wanted to share um, with the rest of the group is that for smaller and you know, small, medium size complexes, uh, one of the options these days is the do-it-yourself security systems that have really high quality cameras available. So what, what I want to share with you is that one kind of a, a way to get you some video security, but not necessarily break the bank of a kind of a small complex, would be taking advantage of the, the do-it-yourself video wireless security systems that are out there. Ring is you know, one of the examples. Simply Safe is the other. Matter of fact, those are the two top rated systems you could put in. And what's really nice about those systems is you can, if you're concerned about your home, you could have an alarm system installed there. And they have cameras now, lots of really good cameras for both inside and outside. So if you have cameras on the outside, and for example, uh, doorbell cameras, video doorbell cameras, and something takes place in your community, you could potentially have a video that you could share with the police if appropriate. Now, all of this is how you feel, whether you feel comfortable sharing with the police, whether you feel comfortable having video cameras on your property, uh, whether your neighbors are bothered by it, all those issues come into play. And I can tell you those are issues based on our experience. Uh, everybody has a different opinion in this area. But it's a way of getting you security. So if there's any sort of problem or concern and it's high enough, uh, that would be a way of getting video cameras onto the properties without breaking the bank. The video cameras have really dropped in price. Uh, I'll, I'll give you my favorite. Uh, there's a company called Wise, W-Y-Z-E.com. And um, all, a lot of this information is going to be actually on a web blog uh, article that I put out that matches this presentation that will have uh, links and information about what we're talking about. But the Wise cameras came out a couple of years ago at 1995 for a high definition camera that you could put up in your home and have video storage on the cloud for no additional cost. All you paid was $19.95 for the camera. These days, they're up to about $25 at Home Depot or Amazon, or you could buy it directly from them for $19.95 and then add on shipping to it, which gets you about $25. But these cameras are terrific. I've, I've had one for about a year and a half. We have it in the house. Works terrific, uh, high quality. Uh, it's an indoor camera. They're about to announce an outdoor camera, but their company has exploded on the scene. They were a startup a few years ago. They've got $30 million in venture funding, and now they're a, 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 what would be a smart home products company. And their focus is on very reasonable price cost. So in video security, that's a way to kind of shoehorn some security into your community. You get everybody you know, to agree with it that's going to be affected by it. But you could immediately have video security and as low as $25, you're done. Uh, you put a couple of cameras on, you've got yourself video security around the area. Now, of course, that's not going to be as good as, you know, the full-blown systems, but it gives you some of that. And then I, I mentioned a couple of other uh, companies and products that you could look at that would make sense on the, in the article itself. So the key with video security is 
it is something we're going to continue to need. The prices are going to continue to come down. Uh, but a full-blown security system still costs a lot of money and takes a lot of time to go through. Uh, the last thing I'll share is uh, we got to the point in our video community, uh, com committee right before the coronavirus hit where we decided that we would send out, because it was going to end up costing and because of all the privacy issues, we were going to do a survey of our homeowners and get feedback on the priority, the concerns about privacy, and there was one other thing we were going to do. But we are going to do a, a digital survey to ask them about it before we went further. Uh, because it was going to be a bigger project than we originally planned. Anyway, I hope that helps. If you have questions, happy to answer them later or afterwards. Okay, this last part is kind of fun. We're going to get to uh, some best practices for working at home. I should rephrase that. Not necessarily fun, but really good things to be doing. <laughs> and will make your life a lot better if you don't have to deal with some of the problems with uh, technology and working at home. So let's get to that first one. Okay, so what, what I, I put here was four things that you should be doing as a best practice as a board member working at home. And it goes for anybody working at home, but in particular, this definitely works. So the first one is upgrade your old software. Uh, one of the challenges that's out there in the world, I'll go through, is the cyber criminals have paid attention to all of these issues that are out there. And uh, the coronavirus has caused this mass exodus from offices to homes. Well, the enterprises have been hit by cyber crimes for the last decade. They're spending hundreds of millions of dollars now in, in their systems for security. The smaller, medium-sized companies they're now investing in security, not as good as enterprise, but they're starting to invest as well. But the people that haven't really done a lot of investing are people working at other homes. So some corporations are helping their employees deal with this. But if you're an independent person or a small business person you're working at your house, uh, you have an issue uh, with cyber criminals using automatic robots to search the internet for weaknesses to then attack and there's two things that they do. They can put a virus in to basically steal information from you, or they can do ransomware. And I've had two calls already in the last two months of people that have had that happen. Uh, the, the criminals basically go in, they find a vulnerability, they lock your system down by encrypting it, having a password, and then they ransom it. They go, well, if you're a, a normal person, they may charge you $500 or $1,000 to unlock each PC. Uh, if you're a bigger company, they may ask for $5,000 or $10,000. So it depends on who you are and what you're doing. But the key is the, the less vulnerable you make yourself, the better off it is. Five years ago was much, much better than it is today in terms of safety with cyber attacks. Even if it's your home just by yourself. Because they don't go one by one. They use computers to just automate looking for the, the vulnerable people to attack. So upgrade your software, Microsoft Word, for example, if you're three, four versions old, you want to get to a version that's being updated by Microsoft. And Office 365 is the cloud version of it, which gets updated real time uh, against viruses and any other protections that they find that they need to improve. So upgrade your software. Next, backup data needs to be in three locations. Your computer, uh, an external disk drive, like they call them USB drives, which are 50 to $100 at uh, Costco or, or Amazon. And you plug it in, and then you have regular backups of your data. So if you get a ransomware and they lock down your computer, if you have access to your data, which is the most important thing, you can go to a Best Buy or something and have some, some professional help you unlock it. They basically clean the computer, and then you just take your data, back it up, and you get, you're good to go. So there is an advantage to having that. And then the third one, Third location is cloud. And the reason for the cloud is for all the disasters we just talked about that are physical disasters, earthquakes, floods, um, mudslides, tornadoes, hurricanes in some locations. Uh, but the idea is you have three locations for your data. Uh, I, I can tell you that every single security person will tell you the same thing. That is something you don't want to mess with, especially if all your kids' photos, all your marriage documents, any sort of documents that you don't want to lose, 
you have them in that one computer, you, you want to have a backup. Next is encrypting the data on all your devices, and there's software to do that, uh, and available, whether it's Apple or Microsoft. The newer systems have the software built in to help you do that yourself. So that if someone does get into computers all encrypted, they can't read it unless they have your password. And then last is personal password managers. Uh, when you're a board member, you have all these extra passwords that you very often have to deal with. Uh, the password managers allow you to have very big complex passwords that can't get uh, copied and used for um, other systems you have. Usually the problems people have with, with passwords is you use the bank password, you change a few numbers, and you use Facebook for the same one. They break into Facebook, they get your password, they go right to your bank, they can figure that out really quick. You need complete separate passwords for all of these systems. Uh, so those four things will really make a big difference for you. And the last slide here is just a comment on ergonomics. So if you're working at home and you're a board member or you're a worker, one of the challenges is that you very often don't have as good a furniture or good as a computer or as good, or, uh, good as chair as you might have in your office. So the point I want to share with you is that there are some really easy things you can do to, to make your life a lot better and healthier. Uh, one is sitting with your back straight on the, on the chair, having a good chair. But the other one, this is a good one, is two to three inches below the top of the monitor, monitor is where your eyes should be. So I've been in meetings, virtual meetings, the last few weeks with a guy that is always looking up. His neck is always bent looking at, he must have a big screen on his wall that he keeps looking at when we're talking about projects. And that is going to hurt his, his neck and it's gonna hurt his back over time. So if you're sitting all day long doing this, you wanna make sure you're sitting properly. Same thing, not looking down at your laptop, typing down or your smartphone or tablet, same issues. So uh, the last item that I wanna emphasize is hands being parallel. And that is uh, parallel to the floor to uh, prevent carpal tunnel syndrome. So those are probably the last tidbits. You, afterwards, you could look at this, um, this diagram and give you some more ideas. But again, I wanted to emphasize, most people talk to me about technology, but ergonomics is part of that technology. I wanted to finish with that. With that, we're done. All right, thank you, Barry. Um, again, you'll see um, I provided the link right here for the article and, or the blog article that Barry mentioned to get more information about the stuff that he talked about today. And I'll also include that um, in the follow-up email that'll be sent out in about a week, week and a half with the recorded, um, this recorded webinar as well as a PDF of the slides and I'll attach that link as well. And so Barry, now we're gonna get ready and go to our Q&A. Quite a few questions there. Yes. All right, and thank you again to our Q&A sponsor, HOI Alchemy, and they also manage our website for Echo. Okay, so let's get to these Q&As. Okay. Um, when appropriate, please advise how long a community swimming pool can be closed to homeowners. This, that question is probably not really related to technology. I think it's your next. Is yeah, that's next good. Cover that? that must yeah, be that's good. Your next meeting. That's going to be for our uh, webinar coming up on Thursday. Yeah, that looked like a good set. That looked like a good session, also. <laughs> um, okay. What has been the method of inviting homeowners to Zoom board meetings? Ah, good question. Um, well, actually, do you guys want to share what you've done, or do you want me to cover it? What, what's best? Um, it'd probably be best just to share as a group. Um, I can also touch on it as well, just from our experience doing the, um, providing the online board meeting services for our ECHO members. Okay, I'll give you one best practice not to do. One of the biggest issues in video conferencing that has shown up is um, people that are new to video conferencing and, and video meetings will, as good faith, take all the information for the meeting and post it publicly on a website or on the board outside, you know, one of the entrances, which gives access to anybody to your meeting. 
So you never want to publish your board meeting information in an open public. You want to send individual invitations to the people that are going to be attending it. Yes, that's and that's what I've seen also too to the um, board members that have used our online meeting service. They most of them they send um, they have a list of emails for their homeowners and they send out the invite um, through email. And then to answer the question about where does the information come from is when you set up a Zoom meeting if you're working with Echo, they'll when they set up the meeting it will have all the credentials and then they could either if you're having them do it or whether you're doing it. They can send you the information and then that information can be emailed out to the, um, the people that are going to come. Right. And you can simply just the email that you would receive from Echo, you can simply forward it to all the people that you'd like to invite. Perfect. All right. A next question. Um, how many users on video with Teams at one time vary? You know, I would love to give you an answer to that, but I don't actually have that. The, um, I've been trying to play with team for a while, but I've been having trouble getting into it. <laughs> so um, I, I haven't been able to allocate time to dig, dig into it. So to be determined. Okay. And Barry, have you found any cloud-based board packet minute builders? That I don't have. Uh, the simple thing that most people tend to go to is some sort of um, Word document in terms of pulling the basics together, but that's not answering your question directly. Uh, no, I, I haven't, I don't know them and I haven't seen one like that, but I will now be looking for it. Okay. For broadcast texts in California, how do we deal with privacy laws? Uh, the companies that are doing broadcast text, um, for, for example, your own community, you're not doing it to uh, strangers, you're doing it to a closed community. So the issues of spamming people doesn't really apply because the people that are gonna get the texting, the broadcast texts are gonna sign up in advance with your community managers. So as part of their profile, it'll say, yes, they wanna get texts. And by the way, that's the same thing with the package uh, lockers. The system that's set up, you either opt in or opt out whether you want texting or whether you want email. And there was a question about how many people took the poll um, to give you a better, um, uh, just to give you more insight on that. To answer that, that it was about 140 people answered that poll. Um, so in, you asked, and it was 85% um, have done an online board meeting. Okay. And someone asked about the particular name of the package locker that you talked about. Okay, give me one second. There's a few of them that are leaders out there. Um, Amazon has a package that they deliver. So they have lockers that you can buy and they have a special group that works with multi-tenant uh, uh, locations. And then give me one second here. I'll look at my own article here. There is, by the way, uh, the company uh, that I was referring to is Lux, uh, Luxer One, L-U-X-E-R One. Uh, it's actually, there's a link on the website and there's also a video demo, a 60 second demo, that it, 60 second demo video on how it works uh, by a person. So you actually get a chance to see it on the blog article. Okay. Um, our next question, contact tracing is important, but is it legal for us as a board member to share with the community the name of a resident who has been diagnosed with COVID-19? Is there a confidentiality issue? Um, that is a, probably a legal, a question for a lawyer. I, I probably, well, I can't give you legal advice on that. But what I can share with you is the real scenario with us is it wasn't the, um, oh, actually, good question. It wasn't necessarily the association that was sharing. It was word of mouth. But that's a good question. I don't have, I, that's, that's a very good question. I don't have a good legal answer for that. All I can do is share how horrified we were when we found out one of our people had the coronavirus walking around for the last couple of weeks and none of us knew about it. So um, the idea of having to broadcast an emergency like that seems like it would be appropriate, but legally, yeah, definitely need to talk to your lawyers. Okay. And, um... 
Do you have any suggestions about systems that can protect individuals' cars? Good question. There are really top rated video surveillance systems for cars now that you can install. They're in Amazon. I haven't looked at them yet for us. Uh, and I haven't had anybody ask me specifically to do the research. So what I would say is you could probably Google search it as top rated car security, car video security systems and see what comes up because I have looked at them and they are available. And, and the way some of them work is they have sensors that, that have cameras inside and sensors that face outside. And when you uh, juggle the car or you make a, a movement, the cameras go on and they start recording. So that's um, the only thing that I've seen that you know specifically re relates to cars that would make sense. And then if you happen to have a Tesla S, they have 360 degree cameras that they can turn on and see who's bothering your car. So there's some good videos on YouTube on that if you haven't seen that. Um, Barry, I've got a question. In the blog article that you did, does it touch at all on any of the laws or um, regarding video security? No. Um, okay. The video security legal aspect is definitely something you're going to want to deal with. In fact, um, you're going to want to deal with, with your own lawyers for your, your community or for the video professional. If, if it's a larger project, the video professional might have some, some legal perspective on that. But what I was going to say is that that is something that we um, were concerned about. And it is, a, it is an issue in terms of what can be covered. Uh, the, the one item we have on our task list related to that is um, changing the CCNRs to include that in public areas we'll have video recording um, for security purposes. And we're going to describe how it's locked up and can't be used, but it is an issue. We've identified it and we have to get it resolved. And one of the suggestions was um, you need to add it to the CCNR so everybody's aware when they move into the property and any updates for your homeowners about it. Okay, and for digital HOA systems, how easy is it to port slash move from one system to another system? And how expensive are those digital HOA systems? I don't have a good answer on how much their overall gonna cost is. It's a lot of them are doing it by the number of units you have. I've seen some prices where they'll charge a dollar or a dollar fifty per month per unit um, as a you know one of the types of pricing. Other people have different types of pricing models. So unfortunately, I can't give you a one answer on the total price. What was the first part of that question again? And how easy is it to port slash move from one system to another system? I can clearly tell you that it is not easy to port from one system to any other system. It's a project. And ideally, you want to have some people helping do that transition, and that's part of the overall cost. Uh, typically, you don't want to do it alone. You want to have the technical people helping to do it. And as part of the budget, you want to include the cost of doing the conversion with the company. Uh, every computer system, you have to go through it over time. Every system gets expired. Every system has to be converted to a newer system at some point. And that process, uh, typically the big issue is making sure you budgeted for the conversion. Because some people that try and sc scoot by and say, oh, it won't be a big deal. It's, it's always a big deal. And you want to get a price estimate to, to get help to do that. OK, next question. Um, uh, Barry, do you have any experience or suggestions uh, about digital management software for self-managed associations? Oh, actually, I anticipated someone was going to be asking about that. And when I've asked around and I've looked and talked with people, there didn't seem to be a whole lot of them that came to the top and said, this is like the best one to get. They may be out there and I just haven't found it yet. What I put in the blog article was a whole list of technology, cloud mobile technology that is designed for small businesses and entrepreneurs that have, many of them have free versions of their software. 
So for example, a ticketing system, there's one of the companies that I put in there, I think it's Freshdesk, that has a free version. It's two o'clock. So if you're a very small um, association and group, uh, you could potentially use a business system that's free and put your requests and orders into a system like that and uh, use it up to the point where you know they want to charge kind of that next level. But many of these systems I put in there have free versions to get started for testing. And you might get to the point where you can use the free version forever. Uh, there's quite a few bits of software out there, like um, um, the um, MailChimp. MailChimp for the first 2,000 people on your contact list has always been free. So MailChimp is real popular around the world. And if you're doing newsletters, you should not be doing them through your email. You should absolutely be using something like MailChimp. And uh, Barry, have you had any experience with um, doing any annual meetings on Zoom? I haven't done annual meetings, but I've been involved with annual sales conferences where you put those in place. Much more complex, a little bit more work. Uh, but the concept's the same. And a product like Zoom could allow you to have breakout rooms and have some very creative environments. There's also some third-party companies that will do virtual conferences. And I think, actually, uh, I believe that Echo is looking into some of those as well. Uh, and what I was going to say is, if you're just kind of doing some basics, Zoom with some breakout sessions could work real well with uh, an um, annual meeting. Hey, uh, Barry, let me add to that because sure. it, that's a technical question. It's a legal question. So sure. uh, you should uh, refer, uh, you, sh you should talk to your attorney about that to make sure you're okay with it. I do know that some associations are doing annual meetings, but there are specific requirements that have to be met. And so oh. go to your uh, attorney, make sure it's all okay and that they've uh, bought, you know, they buy into it because. Otherwise, you could be stepping across a line that you don't want to step across, especially in a contentious election or situation. So be very careful about that. Thanks for the heads up on that. Okay. And Barry, how do you decide if the package lockers are worth the cost? The, the way I would look at it is getting an estimate of the cost. Uh, I typically, for something that's ten or fifteen or twenty thousand dollars, no one wants uh, to have any sort of uh, a special assessment for things. So I tend to believe that with something like that, unless you have this extra budget, is to look at how much it would cost over five years, and see if the budget could absorb that increase, or potentially have an increase in monthly dues that may be a few dollars to help pay for it. So. My take is that's typically how you would look at financing. And then you look at those costs and say, okay, community, <laughs> is it worth it uh, to, you know, spend that extra money so that you don't have your packages being stolen? The thing that I got to emphasize is this is a problem that is going to get worse and worse and worse for the community. This isn't going to go away. And you know, again, from a legal standpoint, I don't know if an, an association is liable for this, but if you're not taking care of, you know, packages, is that a, a liability to the association? Okay. And I'm just asking that. I don't have the answer. And for someone that has video surveillance at their building, but not third shift, any ideas about off-site surveillance? Did you repeat that? Yes. So if someone has video surveillance at their building, but it's not during the third shift, um, any ideas about um, off-site surveillance? I'm not sure actually what they mean by the question. I'm just not. Okay. So if that was your question, um, if you want to um, give us a little bit of clarification on that, um, that would be really helpful. Yeah. And you could always email me or call me if there are questions that we don't get to in the session. Um, okay. What are any suggestions for members that don't have access to technology? Um, again, I'm not sure quite how to address that. There's, if, you, if you're looking for technology support, 
In other words, help with it. Uh, the, the good news is that even Amazon has now a little button you can click that says you can have something installed. So there's, there's easy help there. Um, Best Buy has a very good solution and Apple has pretty good solutions. And Microsoft stores, if you're near one, they also have good solutions if you're using their products. So those are three options to try and get some help. And then there's always the proverbial um, a son, daughter, a neighbor, family member to try and help you. Yeah, just to add to that also, um, in terms of maybe you're, you're doing an online board meeting, if someone doesn't have a computer or they don't even have Wi-Fi, if they have a phone, they can, they can dial into the meeting and still hear what's going on and okay. hear what's being said. So you don't necessarily, in terms of a board meeting, online board meeting, you don't have to have a computer to be able to be a, a participant in that. Yeah, that's a great suggestion. And in fact, in our board meeting, meeting last night, there must have been at least half the people that dialed in my phone besides doing video. Um, let's see, we have a lot of questions. So I was just trying to go through them. Yeah, um, we're, we're already past the two o'clock hour here. So I just want to make sure everybody is aware of that. If they have to move uh, to something else, then that's fine. Otherwise, we'll continue on as long as Barry's willing to answer the questions. Yeah, I'm definitely willing to answer the questions. This is great. Appreciate okay. it. Um, Barry, any recommendations for e-signature softwares? Uh, yes, um, let me see how to say this. Uh, first of all, I have a link and a name in the blog article as well, so that you can click on that. Uh, DocuSign is the leader in the industry, so I kind of cheated and took that as the lead. Uh, it's about 10 or $15 a month if you wanted to do it directly with them. But there are probably, well, there are probably 10 e-signature products plus companies have integrated e-signature into their systems as well. So there's a lot of options. Uh, an easy thing to do would be to do a Google search and say, best top 10 e-signature products. And you'll get the list that are the top 10 people that are out there in the industry. Look at a couple of articles, you'll see the same names in the same place. But uh, specifically, uh, DocuSign is the leader. Uh, let's see, Adobe bought a company called Echostein in the past, I believe, and that's now Adobe's e-signature product that works with PDFs. So there's a couple of options, there's quite a few options out there. And most of them tend to be about between five to $10 a month per user for a, a very low end system. And then it goes up from there. And then there's some free that will give you like three for free per month that are out there. So you can kind of play around with it if you need something you signed once or twice. Uh, you don't have to even pay for it. Okay, and someone asked about, um, I can go ahead and answer this, about Zoom if it's free to use. So they have a few different options to use. There is a free one. Uh, the only downside to that is if you're on a group meeting, you're limited to 40 minutes and it'll kick you off at a 40 minutes. But if you're an Echo member and you're using our online board meeting service, then um, you don't have a limitation for time and we can host up to a hundred people on that meeting. So. Okay. For those of you that are not aware, that is a really great deal that Echo is providing all of you. It's, it is a nice to have. I was, uh, when I first heard about it, I was really excited. That's a, that's a good option for the, for the whole association. Um, Barry, how can an HOA store and maintain electronic files um, so that documents are available to current and future board members to edit and publish? Ah, good question. In the blog article, I'm glad I anticipated some of these questions. In the blog article, I have a list of the top cloud-based document storage systems. So, uh, and I'll just quickly elaborate because uh, of all the questions, and I'll keep it short. Uh, you have companies like Box, Dropbox, Microsoft, uh, Google, and Apple, uh, iCloud, all of those have free cloud storage devices or uh, that, uh, services that are available, get you a limited, and then you could buy more if you need it. All of those systems are encrypted, secure, used by corporations, 
very safe. And it depends, again, if you're an Apple person, you could use iCloud. If you're a Microsoft person, you could use their one, it's a OneCloud, OneDrive. And then if you want to use a, a Box is really a good, good corporate company and Dropbox has started up as actually more personal use, but now is corporate also. But all of those are excellent. They're on the website, on the webpage. Great. I'm going to just bump back to the slide before just so you guys can see again the, um, the web address to visit that blog. That's www.rossross.com slash blog slash echo tech. Okay. And this is an interesting one. Have you found any good tech-based parking solutions? Parking boss is great for doing permits, which is part of the problem. So it's the it's permit parking on property. Is that the is that the question? Is that what I'm hearing? Are there and any good tech minded slash capable patrol and towing services? No. For well, parking well, issues and inside no, situations. I don't know myself about towing issues or opportunities. Um, the permitting system, for some reason, I thought I remembered some of the cloud mobile systems that are out there for homeowners. Uh, that might be one of the modules that I think I saw, but I'm going to have to put that as I think I saw that in this particular package. The one, that, the one thing I didn't get a chance to talk about, which I wish I, I had more time, was there are now robot security guards that are pretty standard out there. Robots are actually here. Uh, you can, there are 300 pound robots that cruise the parking lots for security purposes with 60 different sensors from temperature gauges to video to sound and a bunch of other stuff. And they typically supplement security guards. If you have a large complex and you have security guards, uh, again, this also could be with parking if you want to check parking driver's licenses and parking spots, these things could do it. Um, a security guard will run somewhere between uh, 15, I guess, on the low end, that's real basic, up to $50 an hour for security guards. These robots work 24 hours, seven days a week, and they start at $6 an hour. And they have video security, monitoring, and that's being used in corporations and, and shopping malls and uh, schools and businesses and government. It's, I'm surprised how popular it's become in the last five years. But that is a very high tech answer to patrolling your parking spaces and having the parking, uh, the license plates checked. And by the way, some of these robots have license plate reading technology that they can provide you so that they can tell if it's a criminal, whether they belong in the property or they belong in that spot. Um, as for the video security, um, in your experience, who monitors um, uh, who monitors it? Okay, good question. Uh, two options. For the larger complexes that are going to cost more money, they have a secure lockdown server in your property to do the real-time streaming of all the data. It's a huge amount of data to have real-time data running on you know, like our buildings, five buildings of security data. It's a lot of stuff. Um, and what they were proposing was having a monitoring service, just like your home alarm, and they have video alarms, so that if there's something that happens, uh, the human could actually monitor it. If you don't have the budget, you can just record it, and if something happens, then you could go with the police or go with one of your managers, property managers, to go through the video to look for clues for security. And for home, um, like I said, if you had something happen and you had video, it would be the individual homeowners, there would be virtually no privacy other than what the homeowner decides. Uh, and they could share it with the police um, or the community, depending on what it is. But that's the whole privacy issue. So that's, it's a, it's a solution, but it's not a perfect solution for video security. And do you have any um, recommendations on any of the, um services that could monitor the security or the, the footage? I, I don't have the particular companies that just do the monitoring. What I can share with you is that when we went through and started soliciting bids for video, uh, video security installations, 
it actually was a problem. It, they're very popular right now doing this for everybody, especially corporations. Uh, lots of security is going in because of originally it used to be terrorism, but in general security. So we had a difficult time getting people that wanted to come and talk to us about our property. The other thing is property um, homeowner associations have a not so good reputation of spending a lot of time and not doing very much with this industry. So there's a lot of them that just didn't want to spend the time. So it's been an interesting process going through this. So I, we've got some access to some people, but it's also tends to be regionalized. So, you know, Northern California, we got one person that we're talking with that does this. And if someone wanted to offline find out who that was, we could talk to them, but we, we haven't gone through the, fruit, the complete vetting yet. And we haven't gone through the, you know, the surveys and all the other things you'd go through. So we're not quite there yet, but we had, we have one that we like so far. And do you have any experience with new wireless irrigation control systems, wireless valves, flow meters, leak detectors? Um, uh, we, we don't. They're there, but we don't. Okay. And um, someone wanted to see your contact information. So I'll put that back up for them. Yeah, the website is rossross.com. Just in terms of uh, you know writing it down, it's pretty simple. The company is Ross Ross International, but over the years, we've been in over 25 years now. Uh, we started off with all sorts of things, but Ross Ross is what we ended up with. It's, it's a lot easier. Okay. And a lot of the questions that we're getting um, are have to do more so on the legal side of kind of implementing all these different technology things, technology resources. And so that's going to be something that you definitely want to contact your, your lawyer for. Yeah. Um, and it looks like that might be another webinar that we can do. And, right. And yeah. That's, that seems to be a really hot uh, topic is, so all these great resources now, how do, you know, what about the legal side of doing all these? So yeah. definitely something that we'll look and into. Video, and video security in particular is definitely one of those um, hotbeds when you get it, when you wade into it, there are a lot of issues. Okay. Um, I don't, let's see. Barry, I don't know if you received any questions that were directly to you that um, you wanted to answer, but. I'm not seeing any more that would be, that are not necessarily, that are not the legal questions okay. um, that would be beneficial to the group as a whole. But if you see any on your end that were sent to you, we can, we can try and answer those and then wrap it up. Okay. Let me give a quick plug to the uh, ECHOES website. We do have a professional service provider um, list on our uh, main page you, know, you just click through and there's some providers there and we are available to discuss any of these solutions with you I noticed a lot of questions about you know do you recommend or do you know or have you used uh, a particular service provider and so there are some that are available there but uh, certainly um, they spring up all the time and so a lot of them aren't on our list but uh, I think we're we're in good shape if you need help you can always contact echo right and um, just to piggyback off of that, when you go to our website to search that list, um, you can type in specifically if you're looking for, you know, accounting, if you're looking for towing, you can get really specific and it'll bring you up um, what options, um, it'll bring you up all the options for um, that particular service that you're looking for. Okay. All right. Well, again, thank you to our Q&A sponsor, HOA Alchemy, and thank you so much, Barry, for your time and expertise today. And we will be sending out these slides and a, the recording of this webinar in a week to a week and a half, so be looking for that in your email. And just to give everyone a heads up, we do have another webinar coming up this Thursday on opening HOA communities after COVID with presented by John Gill and Rolf Crocker. And if you're interested in signing up for that, um, you can do, do so at our ECHO website, echo-ca.org under events, and you'll see the link to go ahead and register for that. And at this time, I don't have anything else. Thank you very much, Barry. All right. Thanks, thanks to all the participants. Thank, Thank you, you guys. All.
and have a good rest of the day. Stay safe. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Take care.